This is the Bossit Podcast and it's season three. Um, in season three, what I wanted to do was to reach out to more software entrepreneurs and talk about their business, some of the technologies that they've been developing in what I would see as being sort of interesting areas. And I've got such a conversation today. I'm talking to Uli Exelben from Hippotos, um, and we're going to touch upon a number of subjects, uh, including IDP, Intelligent Document Processing, um, neural networks, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Well, we'll see where the conversation goes. Good morning, Uli. Hey, Mark. Tell me a bit about, um, we, we touched, I didn't know this, Hippotos. I had to look it up before we did this podcast. Um, and I found out that in, uh, in the name is Greek and it means the Supreme One. But apparently that's not where the name comes from. <laughs> you didn't see yourself as the Supreme One. <laughs> I mean, in the end, it, it seems to be a good name, right? For it is, a yeah. Company, I love high it. ambition. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, but the idea was a bit differently. So it has to do with Greece and and sort of ancient Greece because there used to be a female mathematician, Hypatia, right. and we very much enjoyed the story. And given that neural networks and the type of technology we apply is statistics, right? It's mm. mathematics. And we adopted the name a little bit to get the domains and get the trademarks and what have you, but this is where it's coming from, right? So we found uh, okay. out later on what it actually means in, in Greek language. And it also turned out to be a little bit troublesome when it comes to trademark reg registration in, in Greek, uh, in Greece, because they didn't like it too much. Um, but yeah, no. It I, think it's a, good, I think it's a good name, actually. And your, your website, people can find it. It's hypatos.ai. So H-Y-P-A-T-O-S dot A-I. So it's, it's relatively short. And I think it's one of those names that does stick. And it's not too difficult for people from different cultures to pronounce as well, which is another important thing. Yeah, so there's, there's one more aspect here that I like because um, you're probably well aware that Gartner is putting forward the term hyper-automation. Yes. And sort of hypertos and hyper automation, which is also something we are working on, and yes. also fits quite well somehow. Yes, all part of the plan, I know. <laughs> 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 Tell us a little bit about yourself, because I know when we first spoke, I was quite interested because I was expecting you to come from a software engineering background. I mean, you, you, your business is quite technical by its very nature, but I found it quite interesting that you had a, a, a different path to where you are now. No, no, I'm a business guy. I'm, I'm one of the few business guys in, in the company. We are 50 people and, and just very few business people, but I studied business administration. I have a master's degree in accounting and finance, and I have a PhD in finance and statistics. And yeah, I mean, I worked as a consultant. I've seen the problem and I came to realize that machine learning technology and data science in general, which is statistics, right? It's mm. statistics. It's sure. back to what I've been studying is providing pretty amazing opportunities to solve some of those everyday problems in the back office that I've been stumbling across as a consultant so often. Yes. I, I mean, I reached out to you. I'd, I'd written an article uh, about intelligent document processing and it's, it's very close to a lot of the technology that I've been following for a couple of decades now that I think now is at quite a criti critical point where the technology just in the last couple of years has really progressed to have quite a significant change on some much larger solutions. But give an overview. What is it that Hippotos, what's, what's, your, what's your elevator pitch or how do you explain to somebody what Hippotos is all about? So we look at document processing as it is done today, still very manually in a couple of very big back office processes like accounts payable processing, lots of work in the finance department, what company companies do in insurance when they handle claims, what banks do when they look at loan applications. So you have all those documents and you have technology to handle those documents for decades now, right? I mean, you have OCR technology, you have ECM platforms that have been evolving over 
the last couple of decades. Mm. But still, those processes remain incredibly human, if you will, right? It, it's requiring a lot of human labor and human cognitive ability. Mm. And we started to look at this and try to understand what human beings can do that is so hard to replicate. And if you think about it, right, if you think about how a human operator is, and let's stick with this very simple example, is handling a vendor invoice in the accounts payable process. So the human operator looks at the image of a document and says, well, that's an invoice, or this is a delivery note, or this is an order, right? Because you see it and you know, because you've learned how those documents look like and you can identify them right away. That's the first thing you want to do. And then if you say that's an invoice, you need to understand what actually got invoiced. And in order to do so, you are looking for specific information and you are trained to look exactly at the right place, right? Because if you want to read what got invoiced, you are going to look into the line item information, into the tables, and you want to read the line item description. And the line item description is going to tell you, ah, okay, so this is paper that got uh, delivered for our scan stations because it, it, it says it there. So you can um, understand the text. And, and if you think about this, it combines two very elementary capabilities of human beings. They are able to read text and understand words. They understand language, it's language understanding. Mm. And the other thing is they can just look at an image and based on what they learned to look for, they can identify what that is. And what you mean sort of a visual pattern recognition. Exactly, right? Yes. And this is exactly where machine learning technology comes into play because the ability to look at an image this is something that you can also do using machine learning technology, neural networks, um, convolutional neural networks in, in this specific use case, computer vision technology that you would also find in self-driving cars, or it's in the end what, you're, uh, what is going to, to sort the photos on your iPhone, right? I mean, this is convolutional neural networks and it's pattern recognition. So you train the statistical model to learn how you look on a sofa or how you look in the mountains or mm -hmm. at the beach, right? So yes. this is how that works. And um, this is a quite powerful way to process images, which is a important thing. And then once you know what to look for and you see the text and you read the text, you need to understand language as well, which is also pattern recognition, if you will, because you have been trained as a human when you were a kid, how to read. Mm. and what words mean and you're also able to understand words that mean something comparable so if text speaks about a certain vegetable right like a tomato or an onion you are well aware that both of them are actually vegetables and that it's quite likely that they need to be treated or as an accountant booked to the same accounts mm. and this ability is also something that you can solve or, or replicate, if you will, with artificial neural networks. You would be using a bit of different technologies for this purpose. You work with technologies like word embedding, that is normalizing words and word vectors so that you can use them more generically, more agnostically. And then you have technologies like recurrent neural networks that look at series of data so that you can see what normalized word comes before and after the word that I actually want to understand. And then you can use context. And if you look at this, right, if you look at those two general fields, if you will, of machine learning and, and deep learning technology, computer vision and language understanding, if you combine this, you can do what a human operator in the finance department can do in order to process an accounts payable invoice, which is something that an OCR software service or your ECM cannot do because this is not part of how this type of software works eventually.
The, 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 I think that there'll be quite a number of people from within the industry and particularly in this particular sort of subsector that could be listening to what you've just said there and say, yes, but we've, we've had, in regard invoice processing, we've had intelligent document recognition and we've been able to pull out line items from invoices for several decades. What is the progression that you're making now? What, how would you, do you differentiate between what's been possible to varying degrees, you know, OCR has been improving. This is much more than just better OCR. Yeah, no, no, uh, Mark, listen. So, I mean, those IOCRs, intelligent OCR services, they focus on data capturing, capture information from the image of a document. Mm. But I think this is not what IDP is going to be. Let's put it that way, right? I mean, I know that this is what IDP is today, mm. but we like to talk about what we do as document understanding. So mm. it's not about data capturing, but it's about information extraction. So what is actually in those documents and what does that mean? And if you are able to look at documents this way, you can look at things that come after the data capturing. And this is compliance checks. This is more complex allocation to your company's master data records. Um, which is product catalog, what have you, your purchase order information and, and all those type of things. And it also enables you to do or to provide assessment, right? So if you look at the AP process, there is at some point in time, at least for the invoices where you do not have a purchase order that you can just match to, you will have a financial accountant that is going to look at this, at the document, it's going to read its text and then decides that this needs to be booked onto this financial account and that it needs to be allocated this cost element, cost center, what have you. And it needs to go to this first approver because this first approver is the one that, that needs to give its okay in order to to have it paid. And this is things that humans do later on in the processing of such a document, which is today, if you look at IDP, not really in scope because IDP is so much about data capturing and not understanding a document and then using this understanding in order to really try to go for an end-to-end -end automation. And I think this is exactly where it's moving. IDP should not be data capturing. IDP should be end-to-end automation of processing of a document. Mm. It, there's probably a lot of end users of this technology that may have in their mind that this is being achieved by creating lots and lots of templates, because I think that the industry has suffered with a bit of a backlash of cynicism, because there have been big promises <laughs> promised in the past. And when you, when you really get down to the solution itself, it meant that the company was creating sometimes thousands of different templates. Oh, how did companies how be... that did ten thousands of templates yeah. or many oh. templates for one vendor and things like this? Insane. Yeah. How do yeah, you no, answer no. that? It, so I mean, see, it goes back to the very sort of initial point of it. So, or no, I haven't really made that point. But if you look at how OCR and IOCR works, it's very much about rule-based ways to interpret OCR data. And there is three rule-based methods that are generally adopted to solve the data capturing problem. So it's regular expression, regex, right? So you're looking for sort of the string of VAT ID structure or IBAN yes. structure. And if you find it, you know, that's an IBAN here. Yes. Um, key value pairs where you would be looking for certain keywords that you find on in the OCR layer of a document and say, okay, if I find invoice number, it's fair to assume that right after this, you would find the invoice number. It's a key value, right? And then you have those terrible, terrible templates that go into data that you cannot solve as regex or, or key values, where you really say for this vendor or this vendor's invoice works like this. On the left-hand side up here, it has this information, then here the table starts, and this is how the table works. And you put all those boxes and templates and do fingerprinting, optimizing, or however you want to call it, but it's all rule-based mm -hmm. technology. So this is not how the machine learning approach 
would work because right. what you would do is you feed in a lot of examples and then, I mean, this is not, not really how it works, but you would tell your, your machine learning pipeline, just figure it out, guys, right? Find the patterns for yourself and understand, please, how invoices are set up in the same way that you only need to describe to a human being a couple of times how an invoice works and where you find information. And then the human is going to be able to apply this to whatever invoice comes in. In the same way as my two-year-old daughter, um, once she, is, she, she has seen the image of a shark, might be a drawn one or a photo, she is going to be able to identify a shark, even if there's a dolphin next to it, right? She understands, no, no, this is it's something different. It's a shark. Yes. Because she can very easily remember those patterns or identify those patterns and apply those patterns. And this is essentially how machine learning works. Still, unfortunately, with the need to have much more training data to make it learn and not just one photo and then it figures it all out it's more of a number game but the idea is very comparable yeah. okay and, right? and so you move away from rules and templates that's yes. what's needed it's about patterns and understanding how things work give us an idea of the range of solutions that you've currently been supplying because i think a lot of people tend to think about invoice processing but this technology can be applied in lots of different areas. Give us a feel for the breadth of the types of solutions that you're able to address now. So, I mean, we like finance use cases a lot because it's such an everyday, every company all over the world type of thing. But if you look in finance, it's not just invoices and accounts payable automation type of use cases, but in the finance department, you would have a lot of those, what we like to call semi-structured documents which is essentially unstructured, but they come with a certain degree of structure because yes. you know what to look for. And yeah, it comes with tables and, and things like this. Um, you have it everywhere, basically, right? It's delivery notes that end up in your warehouse. It's going to be offers that you get from your suppliers in order to turn it into an order later on. It's orders that you get on the order to cash process or payment advices. It's payment reminders. Think about payment reminders. You didn't pay a supplier and then they sent you a reminder. It's not a document that is ever going to end up in your ERP system. It's just something that you need to deal with somehow. So you have those types of documents in, in hundreds, if not millions of cases in, in, in every company all the time in the finance department. And if you look a little bit just um, next to, to the finance department in HR, for example, um, if HR handles travel and expense, right, could also be a finance task, doesn't matter, right? But in travel and expense reports, you also have it. You have all those cash receipts and your your taxi um, receipts and, and your hotel invoices and all this type of stuff that needs to be checked whether what you did was compliant with the travel guidelines and, and what have you. And if you even go further into sort of more use case or, or more industry-specific use cases for document processing, you are very quickly going to end up in insurance with claims management, where you have all mm. those, if you mm. crash your car, there's going to be a lot of invoices coming in from, from the garage that is going to fix it. And there's going to be um, a lot of reports that are going to be filed and they need to be processed. Mm. Um, in loan applications, banks want to understand how much money you make. So you need to hand in your pay stub. And you need to hand maybe hand in your your uh, bank statements from another bank um, as a PDF. So this is also something that needs to be checked very carefully. And for this, it's not just data capturing; it's document understanding in order to decide whether um, this guy is making enough money to afford this Tesla that mm. he wants to get. Um, I don't want to start with public administration because this would obviously be a, a pretty big domain for IDP, very difficult to get in. We did a couple of things uh, related to Corona because um, there are those um, filing for, for grants and subsidies and so on, which is also a lot of paperwork that is handed in. It needs to be processed by human beings. So there's so much to do when you look at where documents are still processed by human beings and specifically semi-structured documents. Yes, and, and especially in the early days, and this still is the early days of being able to leverage this technology, you need to have a good ROI case, I guess. So it would tend to lead it to particular areas where there's a lot of manual administration. But I guess later on, 
there is the opportunity to perhaps use it in, in all areas of the business as people become more familiar and understand the benefits that it could bring. Have you seen any opportunities for looking at, for instance, large archives of documents? Because one of the things that I think happens is that when an employee leaves, they take with them a lot of, of knowledge and know-how, but they do leave behind with them a footprint in documents and reports that they may have generated that could be of value to other employees. Do you think that that's an area that's going to be better exploited with this type of technology? Yeah, I think there's a, that's a whole area and it's going to start to materialize as a sort of topic in its own, right? Um, enterprise content management in the sense of enterprise knowledge management so that you can identify nuggets of, of knowledge, things that you know as an organization, but that is not overt, right? Because it is hidden in some file servers or in some DMS systems or in some mm. email accounts or knows, right? So also for this, what you need to do, and, and I think it's a it's a brilliant example for the separation between data capturing and information extraction as being something that is different. Mm. So if you are able to search in all corners of the digital memory of your organization for certain types of information using machine learning tech, uh, technology, natural language understanding technology that finds thematic things, right? Not just a keyword, like here the guy is talking about how to how to do risk scoring for what have you, right? But mm. where you can really identify sort of an, an area of information. Okay, so this is stuff that deals with um, this specific topic and the owner of this specific topic or the person that has generated this content is this guy and that guy. And, and you can identify the people and also the knowledge assets using this type of technology. It's, it's a big field. There's a couple of really cool companies that work on this new form of enterprise search functionalities, knowledge searching functionalities and how to organize knowledge. No, definitely. It's, an, it's a quite interesting um, area. And I think it's going to be uh, materializing as, as a completely category on its own in, in the very yes. near future, actually. Sure. Where do you think Hippotos's greatest strength lies at the moment? So for us, it's clearly... So you need to focus in order to, to have mm. impact as, as a, as a scale-up technology company. We cannot do everything that we could potentially do with our technology no. capabilities. So we go after those really, really high volume back office document use cases where you have semi-structured documents as specific as this, but still it's very broad in the end. So it is finance, purchase to pay, order to cash, it's travel expense reports. It's the claims use case that I've been describing. It's the loan application use case. So high volume, semi-structured, end-to-end, right? This is what we like, um, and, and this is where we try to focus on. What, what do you see for the future of Hippotos? Where are the exciting areas that need yet to be developed? Yeah, so a big theme for us and for myself is, so you have the technology. Technology is there, right? I mean, the have developed our bit, uh, Google has developed a lot of it and Amazon have, and so this technology is there. So you are able to use neural networks to train automation models that can solve document understanding tasks. And we have sort of our own our studio suite that can do it in a very easy to use, no code way so that everyone can train their own, own machine learning models. That, that's all good. But what you need to have impact on an organization is you need to solve essentially two things with this technology or you need to solve a problem but what you need to do so that you can solve the problem is that it needs to be fully integrated in the document and data flow within your company so that means that you need to be able to consume the documents as they come in you need to use the existing information within your company that lives in your ERP system or your ECM system or your CRM mm -hmm. system, pull it out, use it to train those models and process those document images. So you need to integrate your machine learning pipeline, which is what that is that you use to, to train machine learning models into 
the data flows of a company. So to make it usable, that's one thing. It needs to be fully integrated. Otherwise it's just a silo, right? And no one mm. really knows how to use this now on this everyday basis. So mm. you need to fully integrate it. That's one thing. And the second thing is you need to acknowledge that this is built for human beings. It's not there to replace human beings. It's built for human beings. That's very important. I a always good point. constantly get asked the question, okay, so what's your accuracy compared to a human being? So yeah. what is the straight through processing rate that we can calculate with? It's completely incorrectly thought about the problem, right? I mean, this doesn't make any sense. The question is very different. How much more productive can one of my operators in accounts payable become using this technology? Mm. Today, she is processing 50 accounts payable a day. And in the future, she's supposed to do 500 or 750 or 1,000. But in order to do so, she is going to use this technology. The technology is not going to replace her. Sure. She's going to make her much more productive. As a consequence, of course, you would need less accounts payable clerks. That's true, right? That's part of it. But this is you should never ask, what is the accuracy uh, compared to human being? What's the error rate that you keep on having if you combine a smart human being and this technology? And it's going to be tremendously much lower than uh, this of the human being standalone. And this is how it needs to be built. It needs to be, be built human-centric because it is going to be used by operators. And if you get those two things right, if you manage to fully integrate it into the data flows and data pools of your company, and if you deploy it in a way that your operators can really work well with it, right, that they can really use it to its full potential, then you're going to succeed. And this is where this space is moving. And this is where we are headed. Excellent. What's the, when um, two final questions for you is, and, and the first one is um, when people first approach you, um, maybe they've heard about you, maybe they find you on, on website. What's the biggest misunderstanding that they typically have that you tend to be clarifying quite a lot? There's so many. There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> so for, I, think, I think, first of all, no one understands the differences between all those vendors out there, IOCR, yeah. machine learning, AI, RPA, IDP, what have you, it's just a mess. No all, those, one, all those acronyms, yes. No one understands. No one understands. There's, it's also really unfair because vendors are writing exactly the same stuff on their websites and in their marketing materials. So it's really impossible to differentiate. Yes. Um, so when I talk to people, people may have experience with RPA and think we are offering RPA. They have been working with some IOCR solution for a long time and, and they are super disappointed, right? And they are sort of projecting this disappointment towards uh, you and say, yeah, okay. you are just, yes. you have a nicer looking website and, and your tool looks a little bit more modern, but it's the same, I'm not going to say the word, yes. um, that, that we have been buying and, and uh, what the marketing people have been advertising to us and just not true. That's yes. what you often hear. AI, AI is the most terrible term in, that, that you can think of because it just doesn't say anything, right? I mean, yeah. if you're very specific talking about machine learning and different machine learning technologies and domains, then it gets much more relevant. But this is a discussion that you cannot have with a tech buyer or with the head of shared service center at, at an organization because they don't want to have a philosophical discussion about neural networks, right? That doesn't help anyone. Oh. So I think that that's one of the, the bigger issues that, that I'm facing on, on this level, on the other level, it's always also quite challenging to work on. I mean, we spend a lot of time in shared service centers and we are working a lot with the people that use the technology eventually. And that's also a very complicated conversation because given that there is this perception of we need to replace human beings using machine learning technology now, um, it's also something that is not making everyone really happy, right? So that also takes a lot of trust building and explaining and making people understand. Yeah, so I, th I think my answer to the question is there's a lot of misperception of what that all is. Mm. And my recommendation always is for companies and tech buyers and, and departments, you need to try out in order to understand. I think there's no way whatsoever that based on marketing materials and PowerPoint presentations, you are going to understand the limitations and opportunities different technology approaches bring. Unfortunately, 
you need to try and see. But on the other side, it's software. So trying is fairly easy to do. And if you have, and this is coming back to this very important point of integrated machine learning pipeline. So if you have a vendor that brings the opportunity to just install a little add-on into your SAP system and train a machine learning model very easily, it's also not going to take a lot of effort and time to do those assessment and, and see for yourself type of thing, right? Working with POCs becomes more and more important if you as an organization want to get your own view on what works and what doesn't. And that's unfortunately the only way to go. Yes, actually get out there and try it. Um, since you first started Hippotos, my final question to you, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned in running the business? Something that oh, you've you need to build, you, you need to build technology for humans and not just technology for your nerdy machine learning engineers. <laughs> that's, the, that is the big learning. that's the big learning. Because just because stuff works yes. doesn't mean it actually does work and have impact for an organization. It's two yeah. very different things. A model can perform very well, but this doesn't mean that it actually adds value to anyone. Mm. And I think that's the biggest learning because we have been looking at completely incorrect metrics in the past when we were assessing whether we are on the right track in what we are doing. We were looking at a lot of tables with numbers, and statistical quality indicators and all this type of stuff. Um, but that's not quite it, right? Productivity, measured productivity, how much better gets an operator using your technology. And you should also be asking the operator if the operator enjoys working with your technology. And if you look at those numbers, um, does it actually have impact because people get more productive? And do they like working with your software? If this is all yes, then you have something. And no one cares if it's deep neural networks of whatever variety to solve whatever problem. It's really the impact that needs to be measured. Good answer, yes. Excellent. Well, thank you very much um, for your time today. You you answered the questions as I expected from the previous conversations that we had with great honesty and being really do being very specific about your answers. And that that's great. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I wish you luck with with Hippotos as you as you take it forward. I think it's in a very, very interesting uh, area within the software sector that I think is evolving quickly and will have a very big impact and implications for other sectors, other adjoining sectors um, as an enabler and, and taking solutions forward. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I wish you all the luck. Thanks, Mark. It was a pleasure. <laughs> So that was talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, IDP. We covered a lot of different subjects there. This is going to be a topic that I'm going to do a number of other podcasts on in the future. So if you think you've got a good story or something that you could add to this particular area, please do get in, in contact. If you think you've got a, a good story to tell anyway within the software sector, then just reach out to me. So it's, this is the Bossit podcast and uh, keep safe until next time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.